show now where else could you see a smooth Italian and a slippery pole <laughs> ah, ah. Oh, lay it on Leon listen I feel good tonight I want to tell you but I gotta speak to my kids they're waking me up too early Every morning, real early, they tiptoe into my bedroom, tiptoe up to my bed and open my eyelids, and they peek in and they watch the fireworks. That's what they see down there. And I asked my genie to speak to them about it, you know? But my wife, she's beautiful. She sees everything in life uh, real pretty. Like, we got seven kids. Seven kids, but to my genie, there are seven little flowers. That's the way she sees it, and I don't mind that. I just hope she ain't thinking of enlarging the garden. <laughs> tax just to listen. You have all heard of singers who can shatter glass. Well, here's something real different. A comedian who can shatter a glass. Yet last time I saw him, I laughed so hard, I dropped it. <laughs> Mr. Flip Wilson. destroy a myth. That's what I want to do. It's this mistaken belief that people have that entertainers go from city to city and wherever they're appearing girls mob them and tear their clothes off and ravish them. When? 
Now, I admit that you meet a lot of girls, but you gotta be careful. After the incident that happened to me in Chicago a couple of months ago, I mean, it's the last night of the show. One of the guys in the band says to me, there's gonna be a party tonight after the show. You wanna go to the party? So I say, yeah, I wanna go to the party. <laughs> so he says, you gotta bring your own date. Everyone has to bring their own date. So I tell him, wow, I don't know if I can make it now. I only know one young lady here in town. I doubt if she can get ready on such short notice. He said, look, he said, I got a girl's name in my address book. Yeah, here it is. Her name is Lulu. She has her own car. Sports car, white wall tires, stereo, stick shift. Seat folds back into a bed. <laughs> said she'll pick you up, bring you to the party, and take you home. I'm pretty sure no one's asked Lulu. Thought runs through my mind, how come no one's asked Lulu? <laughs> well, I say to him, I said, how does she look? He said, wait till you see that car. <laughs> White wall tires, stereo, stick shift, seat folds back into a bed. I said, but how does she look? He said, she'll pick you up, bring you to the party, and take you home. <laughs> I said, well, what does she look like? He said, you want to go to the party or don't you? He gives me a number. It's a five-digit number. I go to the phone, dial four digits, and Lulu answers. <laughs> four digits. She said, yeah, I'll go. <laughs> she picks me up. We go to the party. <laughs> I'm in the party about 15 minutes when the host comes over. He said, look, I want to talk to you. He said, come here. So did you bring Lulu? You bring the broad who looks like someone hit it in the face with a bag of nickels? <laughs> so I said, yeah, what about it? He said, get her out of here. I said, I don't want her in my party. I said, she's been here 15 minutes and she started three arguments. So I tell him, well, why not speak to those other people? Talk to them, make them leave her alone, it should be all right. He said, look, I'm not speaking to anyone else. You get her out of here. He said, she just smacked Sonny Liston. <laughs> Sonny's looking for the guy that brought her to the party. <laughs> I said, you tell her to meet me at the car. <laughs> when Lulu arrives at the car, she wants me to drive. I can't drive. I've been drinking. I'm not going to get behind that wheel when I've been drinking. I know how I drive after I've had a few. I've already promised myself if I drive, I'm not riding in there. <laughs> She's drunk, she can drive. <laughs> so we leave the party. Lulu's driving. <clears throat> and I notice she's holding a wheel with one hand, and on her lap she has a small brown bag. Holding the wheel in the bag. <clears throat> it's an intersection, a red light. Zoom. Lulu ran the light. Get it? Zoom. She ran that light. Then she came back and got the car. <laughs> she ran the light a policeman saw us he chases us pulled us over he approaches the car the officer's a perfect gentleman he approaches the car I said lady you ran the light back at the intersection but in this instance I'm not going to give you a ticket I'm merely going to warn you and suggest that in the future when you're approaching an intersection that you exercise a little more caution she said I did what <laughs> I ran what light? She said, I didn't run any light. This looks to me like police brutality. <laughs> you officer said, lady, don't get upset. I'm not going to give you a ticket. It's only a warning. Don't get upset. She said, what do you mean, don't get upset? It's 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm driving along here drunk. <laughs> can't give me a ticket for nothing. How much is a nothing ticket? She said, I didn't run any light. That light didn't change until I was in the middle of the intersection. She said, I saw the light, and I saw you, and I saw you see me. And you saw me see you see me. This is the same way that ride started in Los Angeles. realize how critical this thing's become and it's up to me to straighten it out so I lean over and I say officer she ran the light 
I realized there was a possibility of her running the light, and I tried to warn her. But before I'd gotten it out, she'd passed through the intersection. So I appreciate you are not giving us a ticket, leaving it at the warning stage, and she's sorry. She said, I'm what? <laughs> what do you mean? How are you going to tell this man that I'm sorry? She said, I started this argument with the officer. I don't need you to sit there and Ralph bunch my argument. <laughs> my problems, you're sitting there with a bag of LSD on your lap. NBC was the network that Dean's show aired on. They really wanted Dean. They were looking for a performer who could do it all. And they made a very simple deal with him. They said... Okay, you go ahead. We won't interfere. We won't tell you how to do it. We won't tell you who to hire. We won't tell you anything. We trust you. Go ahead. And they made that deal with him. And it was really very simple. Dean's deal with me is almost as simple. I was doing the show for about a year, and he came to me one day, and he said, Hey, pal. I want you to be my partner. And I said, your partner? And he went, yeah. And I said, gee, that's great. And he reached out and he shook my hand. That was 35 years ago. There's never been a piece of paper that's ever existed between us. Not in 35 years. Never. It's a handshake. It's two guys looking at one another and going, hey, pal, we're together. Come in. Come in. <laughs> hey, hey. Oh, I didn't hear nobody knocking. Did you do the knocking? No, I didn't hear the people knocking. Say, uh, Dean, I hope you don't mind, but I brought a few friends along for the evening. Do you mind? No, oh, bring them in. Bring them in. Frank. Hey, yeah, bring them in. Come in, my girls. Oh, boy. Right <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. I want to tell you about this. Hey, that's a tasty group you got there. Wait a minute, you haven't heard the rest of it yet. No, there's something else? Yeah. What? They're musicians, and if you pardon the expression, this is my sextet. Sextet? <laughs> no, seriously... These are, the, these are all members of my PTA group. Oh, they are? Well, I'd like to attend some of those meetings. Oh, oh, it, lovely, oh, it lovely, means lovely, beautiful, lovely. but the, what do you want with six girls, Frank? Oh, I'll think of something. And, uh, <laughs> now, I would not like you to meet these girls, uh, Dan. Yeah. First of all, this is uh, uh, 97. Yeah. I mean, 98. Uh, 99. <laughs> 90, 10, 90, 11, 90, 12, and 90, 13 is right here. Aren't they sweet girls? Oh, they sure are. They I'll tell sure you are. something. You see, folks, every Monday I start all over again with number one. Oh. Now, what? Those fingers in my hair, that sly, come hither stay. It's my conscience bare, it's witchcraft. <laughs> witchcraft. And I got no defense for it. The heat is too intense for it. What good would common sense for it do? Cause it's witchcraft. <laughs> That crazy witchcraft And although I know It's strictly
such an ancient fish But one we would not swim Cause there's no nicer witch than you And you And then you And then you I like it, I like it Capital. Our chief executive holds an important meeting with his top level advisors to discuss the state of the nation. One of his top advisors is this man, an expert who knows everything about our vast military industrial complex, a knowledge that has earned him the respect of the American people and enabled him to make a fortune in the stock market. <laughs> Man, an environmental protection specialist who earned the thanks of a grateful nation by keeping America beautiful when he dropped 5,000 tons of multicolored sequins on Lake Erie. <laughs> Finally, this man, an expert in consumer affairs, every day finds this man in the marketplace of America having affairs with consumers. <laughs> this America awaits the important decisions that will be made in this room. Mr. President, the bill is ready for your signature. Thanks to me, nobody else. I'm about to give new hope and happiness to the poor, the needy, the destitute, the impoverished, and the hardcore unemployable. Mr. President, what are you going to give them? Scenic welfare checks. <laughs> uh, picture Mickey Mouse begging for food stamps. <laughs> Lyndon Johnson singing, When You're Hot, You're Hot. <laughs> the last six months, certain bills have reached this desk. And I am sad to announce I have a $2 billion deficit. Yeah, but what the heck? Your daughter only gets married once. <laughs> How are we going to hide $2 billion in wedding bills from the American people? Well, let's do what we always do, charge it off on the SSD program. <laughs> well, Mr. President, we tried to keep the wedding small by just inviting your friend. That's very true. We're going to spend $400 for umbrellas. Well, we had to have umbrellas. It rained. Yes, and I'm still waiting for Billy Graham's excuse. Why didn't he stop the rain? If he can't get to the top man, let's get someone who can. Look at this airline thing. Who invited Vice President Chi from Vietnam? Uh, we had to, sir. He supplied the rice. <laughs> Why don't we get one of our own? You know who I mean, Uncle Ben. <laughs> well, he couldn't come. He took Aunt Jemima to a panther meeting. <laughs> Here's the bill 
bullet sticks in my claw, and I do have a claw. $88,000 for wedding pictures. Look at this. Let me make, make this perfectly clear. They didn't turn out perfectly clear. You must understand, we had to spend an awful lot of money fixing your cheeks in the pictures. Your cheeks look awfully puffy. I am a puffy cheeked president. But when you are the president, like I am, and you run the country like I do, you do an awful lot of this. The Dean Martin Variety Show collection is really that. It's, it's a collection of, of a group of marvelous moments from 245 shows that we did through the years. And you're watching a master performer at work, a master comedian, a singer with charm, just oozing, a smile that is devastating. I mean, quite possibly the cutest guy that you'll ever want to be around. What you see when you look at this man working is really what he is, a genuinely sweet, nice, decent guy. Take a deep turn. Well, did I get any on you? <laughs> Ken's a wonderful guy, and he's so good to his wife. He, he knows how hard she works at home. And no matter how tired he is, he gets her out of the house at least two or three nights a week so he and the maid can be alone. <laughs> Which I never thought of. <laughs> my funny valentine, she drinks my turpentine. How <laughs> did in a crowd but when you get her alone she's even worse <laughs> I like that I like that is it raining? Oh. well and <laughs> I'm gonna go to the couch <laughs> yeah but there's something I have to tell you I've been thinking things over and I'm no good for you. <laughs> I think maybe it would be better for both of us if you went back to Snooky Lansing. <laughs> Don't you feel too bad, Ken. Just remember the famous words of Caesar who once said, Here, let me mix that salad. <laughs> Mexico together, and I don't know what's going to happen. I know. <laughs> what? I've what are you looking at? I've been to Mexico. Thank you. <laughs> he don't know it, but he's on the air. Go out, Mitchell. Thank you. All right. I'll let you know. Thank you, Bob. Okay. Keep surprising me. It surprised me. Jerry here walks through there. I'm quitting. <laughs> you all will? <laughs> mm, your sweet expression. The smile you gave me. The way you look when we 
met It's easy to remember So hard to forget I hear you whipsin' guys I've ever known, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Jimmy Stewart. I'm so glad you could make it back on my show. Glad to be here. Well, that's a job. I got to tell you, I really enjoyed making that movie Bandolero with you. I enjoyed it. You enjoyed every minute of it, Dean. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, making pictures can be a lot of fun, but, you know, I'm really getting to enjoy television. Well, you ought to have a show of your own like this one. Oh, no, I, I couldn't never do oh, what you do. Oh, what do you do, heavens to Betsy? You could sure do that. <laughs> Sir, you watch my show every week, don't you? I do, I do. Well, just do what I do. No, but it wouldn't come out the same, Dan. Why don't, don't we find out, Jimmy? You just back up there. Just back right up there. Oh. Go ahead. Yeah, we're going to find out something. And now, here's the second half of the Jimmy Stewart Show. <laughs> my tutu. <laughs> well, you, you, you all know my Ken Pal Lane. No, you, you, you mind fixing that card there? It's my pal Ken Lane. You know, Ken's a real topper. He, a, troop, a, a trooper. <laughs> He, he, he got out of sick bed to come over here with us tonight. Uh, his bed's got the flu. <laughs> I'd say, I, that's what the bed has. <laughs> what, what, do, what are the first couple notes of that? A fine romance, my 
my friend, this is a fine romance, don't tell my missus. so long and go over to the couch. But Ken, I, I want you to know something, Ken. I want you to know that I think that this is, look right at me. <laughs> I want you to know, Ken, that I'll always remember you this way. And that's because I've never seen you any other way. <laughs> Why, it's Dean Burton! a tired man. <laughs> and now, let's look in on a man who absolutely uh, has no self-control. <laughs> hey, Phil, I, I brought you your arming. I'm running right out there for Yeah, I know, but when I called you this morning, I didn't want you to go to a lot of trouble, but my smalls are just crowding up on me. <laughs> so look at that whole basket full of work. And, it, you know, I've been so busy, see, oh. that I just didn't have time to yeah, do... But 
Oh, well, I do. You got behind, but do you know there's a time and place to do your ironing? I I got mine finished before the show. What a I mean, what's a mother to do? Oh. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, baby, <laughs> you got to do a little every day. I always do mine while... A little every day yes, you got keeps it. the doctor away. It it's shows. better than eating the apple. Baby. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 I know that, but you gotta do a little every day. Like, yeah. I always do mine while guiding light is on. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, I dampen my white goods with the tears. <laughs> <laughs> It's not going to take me but a minute now huh? because I just stroke this kid lightly. I have to press a few things, you know, for the morning. Oh. Just hit it. Well, well, hold, 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 hold the pad. I ain't you. I, I, I aren't you? Can't you start? Ah. 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 Any ironer knows you can't start right off like that. You forgot the starch. <laughs> Thank you, I did. I'll mix a batch. You'll mix a batch? Yeah, see, I always like it a little, just a... Well, I get it ready-made, that stuff. Great, pardon me, Miss Pendergrass. Just a shade stronger. Miss who? Uh, I have that did paddle for to put in a little touch of fabric softener. I'll put that in there like this. Now, a lot of people use a spoon, but you don't get enough that way. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know whether to iron now or put it on like it is. <laughs> And you can bet me there ain't a lump in it, no baby. No lump at all. Oh, oh, that's 99 and 40, 400% starts. That's what yeah. that is. It's only one thing. What do you use on the shirts? Oh, well, I never put in. I ain't going to put no starch on there. No. I figure this way. There ain't no shirt of mine going to be stiffer than I am. Yeah, baby. Here, I'll put this kid away. I'm gonna fail, fail. Uh, You're not ironing your shorts. <laughs> huh? You got to be neat. <laughs> All the way, you never know. Well, it seems like oh. an awful waste of time, Bill. I mean, who's oh, gonna see him? Not only that, who's gonna see him? Yeah. I might get in an accident sometime. <laughs> I never know you're going up and down there. There they are. How sweet they are. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you, I could get in an accident with these. Yeah, Bill, how about if you get too much starch? Ooh! <laughs> Through our 
every major city in the United States has a problem with topless clubs like New York or Chicago or Los Angeles. I think the craze really started here in Los Angeles. What usually happens is the city fathers will go down to one of these clubs for like uh, six or eight weeks and they'll try to decide whether they're violating an ordinance or not. <laughs> And in Los Angeles, we not only have dinner at topless clubs, they now have lunch in topless clubs and are going to start breakfast topless clubs. These are two guys who walk into a topless club, only they don't know that it's a topless club. Gee, this, this is a real nice place, Harry, you know? Yeah, sure. They must uh, have great food here. They, they do a heck of a luncheon business. They sure yeah. do, yeah. <laughs> oh. oh, hi, miss. I like a scotch on the rocks. Uh, water. Wa water. Uh, se seven up. It doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. Make that two seven ups in water. <laughs> Do you believe that, Harry? Did you see that? Boy, oh, she must have been late for work. That's ridiculous. <laughs> There's going to be a raid in this place, and there's no question about it. I'll tell you that. We better call the wives. Tell them we're here. Oh, all right. <laughs> you got any change on you? <laughs> oh, hi, hi. Uh, you, uh, you, you have a pair of nickels. Uh, two, two nickels for a dime. few magic tricks that I could entertain my genie with, you know? Oh, it's easy. I'd have to do a blind. Any particular trick you'd like to learn? Yeah, how can I make her disappear? <laughs> For how long? What's the limit? <laughs> Having met your lovely wife, I won't teach you that, but I can teach you a few tricks. I bet you can. <laughs> you know? <laughs> hey, you know a trick that always amazed me? I saw, you know, saw a woman in half. Oh, that, that old chestnut. Hmm? We don't do that anymore. Sewing takes too much time. Now we chop off their heads. Professor, a little head chopping music, please. And bring on the guillotine. Dangerous. Tempered steel from the finest sword maker in Spain. That thing isn't dangerous, it's fatal. Just get up on the platform, I'll show you what I mean. Uh, what's with the celery and the lettuce? Ain't this kind of a crazy way to make a salad? Hold the music, Dean. This is only for the purpose of demonstration. Hmm? After all, vegetables don't bleed. <laughs> Watch very carefully. Yeah. Push. <laughs> ah, I'll ask for your kind of him well. <laughs> if that cabbage head was human. Mm -hmm. yeah, Supposing you know, it was yours, even. Yeah, sure. You know any card tricks? Well, it's nice card tricks, easy enough. Slide Dean, it. Dean, this mm -hmm. is the big-time card tricks. Just put your head in that hole. 
Magically, this Tibetan wonder chopper separates the men from the boys. A little wonder music. Yeah. My head from my shoulders, I'm All right. Hold him in, girls, so we can't get out. I promise you, you won't feel a thing. Dean, huh? are you comfortable? <laughs> I don't know. I uh, might look a little better on you, Orson. <laughs> uh, what are you doing with that knife, pal? I just want to get the feel of it. Huh? Just want to get the feel of it, that's all. Let's feel of it. There we are. All right, hold the music. Now, before we attempt this experiment, have you any last message for our viewers? <laughs> Who gave you this trick, Jeannie? <laughs> the death blade is passed through Mr. Martin's neck, severing the spinal column, the esophagus, and the medulla umbligata. <laughs> it will snip off that celery. Would you put that? Oh, the celery's there. That's right. We'll snip off the celery there and place just under where Mr. Martin's nose will have been. <laughs> Are you ready? Now, I want you to use all your, all your strength, girls, and all your weight. I'm going to use all my weight, too, Dean. <laughs> All right, one. On the count of three, we're going to push. You understand what I mean? Two. Three. Detective with the L.A. Police Department. I'm just an ordinary detective. After 20 years, I get a pension. After 30 years, I get my own series. <laughs> Let me tell you about my most recent case. I was walking along the street, and suddenly a shot rang out. <laughs> Sounds like it came from in there. <laughs> Excuse me, did you hear a shot? <laughs> Hey, you. Hmm. You been shot? No, but I've been bombed plenty of times. <laughs> all right, lady, all right. Get up against the wall. Who are you? I'm Detective Wall. <laughs> what's your name? She's Mrs. Murgatroyd. Mrs. Murgatroyd, tell me what's happening here. I'm, my husband's been shot. This is my fiancé. Your husband's been shot, and already you're engaged to another man? <laughs> Well, when's the honeymoon? Uh, three weeks ago. <laughs> All right, don't get smart with me. Just put your hands up. Oh, good, 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 good. Yeah, hold that, will you? Huh? All right, now I'm going to need some information. Yes. All right. <laughs> You're lucky he didn't bring his umbrella. All right, you. Who murdered you? You won't talk, eh? <laughs> Just like everybody else. He doesn't want to get involved. <laughs> All right, tell me, how old was your husband? Ninety-seven. Ninety-seven? Did he have a will? Yeah, but he didn't have the way. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute here. If your husband was shot, what are those two stab marks doing on his chest? I beg your pardon. I withdraw the question. <laughs> so what did you do before you got married? I worked for an answering service. An answering service? Yeah, she was a call girl. Oh. <laughs> All right, let's get down to business. Are you ready to confess? Certainly not. 
How about now? <laughs> okay, I confess. All right, say two rosaries and call me in the morning. <laughs> I can't stand to see a woman cry. <laughs> Well, then, that's much better. <laughs> well, it's very clear to me that the murderer is someone in this room here. Is it you? No. Is it you, Mrs. Murgatroyd? No, no. Is it you? No, 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 no. You little yellow basket. Well, then, it must be me. All right, you're under arrest. Come with me down to the station. Mrs. Murgatroyd, Mrs. Murgatroyd, Mrs. Murgatroyd. Say, hey, how come you keep saying Mrs. Murgatroyd, Mrs. Murgatroyd? Because now that I'm under arrest, anything I say will be held against me. Hold oh, on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> something I've got to tell everybody. This little girl with the funny voice has a name. Her name is Jerry Jamerson. And I'm telling you that because she's about to change it. That's right. She's going to leave us. She's going to get married. It's kind of sad for us because... Oh, hush. It's sad for us because Jerry's been with us right from the beginning, but we really aren't losing a dancer. We're gaining a doctor. <laughs> Yeah, the lucky guy is Dr. Alan Lerner, and uh, two of them are going to raise a bunch of kids with funny voices, and <laughs> good luck, sweetheart. <laughs> Let's go on with you. <laughs> to see you again. <laughs> um, I have often been out... Thank you. Uh, I, I have often been asked to play a number all the way through. And I'm delighted tonight to announce that I am probably not going to do it. There are two reasons for that. One is that I don't know anything all the way through. <laughs> and that happens to be the other reason also. However, <laughs> I have uh, been asked specifically to play the first movement of the Moonlight Sonata by Ludwig van Beethoven. And that is what I intend to do right now. Kind of a short day, wasn't it? <laughs> I wonder why there are three petals on this grand piano. <laughs> <laughs> Who do they think I am? <laughs> Let 
ladies and gentlemen, it is impossible to remember everything. <laughs> Let me play for you some music that I have here ready. I, I am going to play, these are popular things and I have brought them because I like popular things. And, and, uh, <laughs> I brought her with me from New York. I just come out from the East Coast, and I was amazed that. Well, the further west you go in this country, the closer you get to the Far East. <laughs> Where is that fish ball? Up with you? Now let let me play some of this. This has no significance. <laughs> now, the Baldwin Piano Company has asked me to announce that this is the Steinway again. <laughs> Don't you like good music? <laughs> Why do you interrupt me all the time? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Olivia Newton-John.
Orson and Dean, it was love at first sight. They just, uh, Orson just looked at Dean and he went, this guy's having a great time. And Dean looked at Orson and he went, hey, this guy's pretty cute, isn't he? And I went, yeah, he's pretty cute, Dean. And they worked together very well. I'd like to talk to you tonight about a great lady. And she was just that, a very great lady and a celebrity, which is something else, of course. A toast of society. On top of that, she was a suffragette, a sort of great-grandmother of woman's lib, and one of the finest singers in this country. Her name was Miss Julia Ward Howe. Here she is in the happy autumn of her brilliant life. Now, Miss Julia was born before photography was invented, and though there were cameras by the time Miss Julia had grown up to be beautiful, and she was, you know, very beautiful, if there is a photo made of her back in her youthful days as a breaker of hearts, I haven't been able to find it. Never mind. After all this time, we still remember her with so much affection because of some words she wrote for a song. I don't think there's any argument that it's the greatest song ever to come out of America, and hers are the greatest lyrics. The music started well ahead of the words. It started in church and then moved out into the battlefield. It began as a hymn and grew to be the most heart-quickening, marching song in all history. It's quite a story. Before the Civil War, there was an old man named Brown who tried to start a civil war all on his own. An angry old man who reckoned it wasn't enough just to say that slavery was wrong. Something had to be done about it. Slaves had to be set free. So he and his sons and a few other people picked up their guns and tried to do just that. It didn't work, of course. Nobody was freed. Old Mr. Brown was caught and tried for treason and hanged. He was either a martyred hero or a bloodthirsty villain, depending on your viewpoint. It's an argument that's still going on. You can dispose of me, he said, standing on the scaffold. You can dispose of me very easily. This other matter has not been disposed of. This Negro question, I mean. The end of that is not yet. Well, they buried him. Not so long afterwards, that crazy private battle of his broke out so publicly that it all but broke our nation in two. It very nearly destroyed us. And early on in that terrible civil war of ours, a few soldiers picked up that half-forgotten hymn tune and improvised some words, and pretty soon an army was marching to it. Maybe what old Brown had done in life was unlawful, but the spirit moving him was freedom. A spirit in our land, we like to think, can never die. And that's the sense of what the soldiers were singing. John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave, but his soul goes marching on. Carried the whole Union Army into battle. Well, Miss Howe was the lady who made it the battle hymn of the Republic. The whole republic, a nation, as Miss Howe's great admirer, Mr. Lincoln, so greatly put it, dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Her song was for all of us to sing and all of us to live by. 
She'd had a sleepless night. This happened in Washington, the old Willard Hotel. And somehow, just before dawn, those words all came to her all at once, as though some other hand had written them and passed them on to her. So Miss Julia Howe got up out of her hotel bed and found, as she said later, an old stub of a pen. And as daybreak lightened over a sleeping city, sat down at the window and got it all written out before the sun had reached the paper. Those words of hers still helped to bind and hold us. A song not for half a nation to march to, but for a whole people to stand up and sing together. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free while God is marching on. <laughs> 